All right, everyone. I think it's just about time for us to keep going. I know it's four o'clock, but I think this next uh, speaker will be well worth waiting for. My name is Aaron. I work on governance issues at the Civil Service College with the Singapore government. Uh, and Jan called me a couple of weeks ago and said, will you introduce one of our speakers at the conference? So I said, who? And then he said, Sidney Brenner. I said, yes, of course. No, no doubt about that. Um, you all know Sidney's work. He is one of the giants in the field that we today call human genetics. So I will not go through his bio, but I will share three things that we talked about at lunch that um, made me extremely pleased, uh, and I'm sure will, will make all of you pleased about his talk after this. The first is that he has no PowerPoint slides, uh, which will be an interesting innovation, I think, on what we've heard so far. We've seen some great slides, um, but I think we'll, it'll be a novel experience right now to, to move into a slightly different mode of communication. The next thing is he's talking about the idea of whether administration is necessary. And one of the big words that we hear a lot in government is the concept of the key performance indicator, you know, this evil spawn of the devil that's called a KPI. Um, and Sydney described that slightly differently at lunchtime as key promises indefinitely. Right, uh, which I think is a much more mature and sophisticated way of looking at the whole concept. And it's one I shall try and evangelize in the rest of our government as much as I can. Uh, the last thing that he shared, which I thought was very much in spirit with the theme of this conference, is the fact that when he was doing his PhD, of course, the field of molecular biology did not even exist. And he, he worked out of you know, a, a physical chemistry lab. And I think there was something interesting there for all of us to think about. You know, we're engaged at the moment in a conversation that is about a field in the making, not a field that has already been defined. And I know I'm looking forward very much to hearing his insights from the biological world about whether administration is necessary to handle and navigate this phenomenon that we're all calling complexity and I think are only just starting to understand. So without any further ado, with no PowerPoint slides, Sydney Brenner. Thank you for the uh, uh, introduction, and uh, I hope that what I'm going to say will be of relevance. Uh, I put the title in that way because we know that administration is definitely not sufficient. Uh, but is it necessary is something I will leave you to decide. But we can say what the conditions are, and this is what I'd like to talk about today uh, and the lessons that can be learned from the biological world, uh, which uh, is completely self-organized. That's what I start from. So I don't believe there was a designer, because I'm sure if he was of the quality that we have going around, there'd just be a damn mess. Uh, they wouldn't they wouldn't be able to design the animal pretty at all well. Uh, but what I want to start with is something that is a new idea in the natural world, and remember, biology is part of natural science, and that is that uh, we have very complicated organisms, complicated, lots of parts, lots of different molecules inside them. Uh, we have lots of different ones. And the question is, how are we to understand all of these? And so we need to ask three questions, and that's all biologists ask. They must understand how these organisms work, I mean, how they actually do what they do, how they implement whatever they do. So we need to know how the kidney works and how the liver works and the intestine and all the parts. Uh, we really, really want to know how it gets built because we don't build tiny little men and then have them grow up, a swell up like blowing up a balloon. No, you're born as a single cell. You all start with one cell, and then the cell divides, and different parts of the chain. So that's the how it's built, 
That's the classical fields of embryology and physiology that I've, the, the study of function, the study of construction, and of course, the most important one is how it all got that way, the study of evolution. And what we try to do, at least what we should be trying to do, is to try and see that there is a, not I'd say a, uh, a simple explanation, because at the moment biology doesn't have a language to offer simple explanations. And I think that that's one of the problems that uh, we face in our subject, is one is the language that we should use uh, to talk about the things that we talk about. I mean, physics is great, there's mathematics, I think. If you can understand the mathematics, you've got a language that you can manipulate and that you can use in order to do what is an equally large number of very complicated natural, uh, national, uh, uh, natural phenomena. Now, I'll start with uh, a little quotation. It's from a true history. I was in Japan, and I heard an interminable lecture given in Japanese with an English translation, which takes twi which takes twice as long to say in Japanese as it does in English. So this was about a 40-minute lecture, but it took two and a half hours. Okay? And amongst this, then at the end of this, a question was asked of the speaker, and uh, he said, what is the Buddhist definition of life? And uh, he replied, because as you know, Buddhism's very accommodating religion. He says, uh, Buddhists believe everything's alive. Uh, mountains are alive. So I stopped him and I said, mountains are not alive. So he says, how do you know? I said, you can't clone a mountain. There is no internal description inside a mountain which specifies the mountain. Mountains are outcome of complicated, very complex interactions of uh, movements of, of the surface of the planet and so on, with weathering and so on. There's no internal description, and that is the difference. So in a strong sense, we are all the best implementation of Turing machines you could ever wish for. Both Turing and von Neumann went off uh, to try and build the program uh, occupied computer. And of course, we were all there uh, available because we are the best implementation of a Turing machine, a Turing von Neumann machine. And I think that that has to be the central idea of biological systems, is they've got genes, they've got a description, and that description specifies the order. So later I'll, I'll talk about this in a, in a moment. And just out of interest, we could ask, well, we know mountains don't have any genes in them, but we might ask whether social organizations have the equivalent of a DNA uh, that actually specifies the society, and where would it be? So you might ask whether the laws do this, but I don't think it's the same thing. I don't think it's the same thing. So one of the objects now that I want to say is that how are we to understand this level of complexity or complication? How do we understand how all this molecular machinery works? Because that's what we have to do. Because all changes occur in the script. Okay. They don't occur in the organism itself. And the organism has no way of endowing the script with new properties. So the script is changing all the time. And uh, what is successful in biological terms survives. 
is a novel organism, could be a novel organism. And I also mentioned some of the conditions for meeting that. Right, so the two things I want to talk about, uh, and I want to talk about a bacterial cell, first of all. Now, uh, many years ago, I went to meet the chairman of the British Computer Society, who was very keen to meet me. He was a man who wrote software for banks. Uh, this is in the 60s, so that was pretty heavy going then, uh, because all the computers were gigantic things with punched cards and so on. And he said he wanted to meet me in case we, he could learn something uh, from biology that would help him. And I wanted to meet him just in case I could learn something from computing which would help me. Uh, but of course, neither of us helped each other. But I had a good lunch. I had a good lunch. <laughs> so, so what I think is the thing, what, what sort of framework do we have to do this? So you might say, well, it's all written down. It's just this DNA script. But, I mean, no one's going to stand up there and announce a human being is a G, 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 G for three billion bases. Why? Because meaningless, right? So we have to understand what is the value of these things. What do they express? And, of course, this brings us to the whole business of understanding how that script can change this. Well, I'm going to take a bacterium because I'm going to put this in a framework and give it to a control engineer. I say I've got a factory. A factory's got 2,000 uh, chemical processes in it. Uh, they're all connected. They all lead to various products, about 500 products that we must make. And tell me, how do you control such a factory? Okay, so a control engineer who knows to make uh, petroleum refineries and so on, says, ah, oh, well, that is, yes. Well, we put a probe in each reaction vat, okay, so that we can measure temperature, pressure, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. and then we can also have effectors that we can actually change the temperature, change the pressure, we can connect things, we can stop the flow, and so on. And what we do is we take all these measurements up to a central computer, okay, in which we monitor what's going on, and, of course, we can apply corrections, which is a very tricky thing in control engineering because once you depart from the steady state, you become metastable, and we all know what that leads to. It leads either to going to one, which means the factory explodes, or going to zero, which means it dies. Okay? So, what is this? So there's all kinds of mathematical tricks to do this. But one of the interesting things is that the computer, which has to now administer itself, so is doing lots of different things, and computers hardly ever work in parallel. So it has to have some priority. So it must do a big computation in order to do the priority. And you will find that, in fact, as it was with the new 360 when IBM produced it, the, although the, the functionality was predicted to be much faster than the predecessors, it was only faster by a few percent, because most of the resources were occupied in administering the resources of the computer, most of the time, that is. So, <laughs> you ask then, uh, and so he would not believe it. Of course, I left out from my little chemical factory uh, the, the business <coughs> that it also multiplies every 40 minutes, creates another factory, exactly the same as the previous one. We left that out because that's 
So what's wrong with, the, with what I call the Detroit model that this guy says, you know, it's a line, you have pipes, you join everything. And what's wrong with that is, is, is that since it clearly uh, would, would be very difficult to think, we must look into the hardware of the bacteria to see not how, t not how it, it defeats, you know, the, what I believe is called the Pontryagin computation for optimization, very complicated uh, arguments, and doesn't perform any of those mathematics because it's too stupid to do that math those mathematics. So it must have some way of getting the result right, a different way. All right. And that is why I think biology, the way you should view biology is the same way you view income tax. Namely, it's criminal to evade paying income tax, but they're legal means of avoidance. Okay, so how does, how does the bacterial cell avoid the computation that would be required in running a factory with several thousand processes? So I'll tell you how it does it. First of all, it's very small. A bacterium is exactly 10 to the minus 15 of a liter, a femtoliter. Okay, it's a cubic micron. So this means that diffusion occurs very quickly. So the average transit time of the average reasonable molecule, say molecular weight 500, is about a millisecond across the bacterium. So we have this. Now, how does, how does these measurements, which I would have to do if I had the computer model, how does the bacterium avoid this? That is, I'd have to be measuring the amount of tyrosine, tryptophan, 20 other amino acids, uh, all the nucleotides, measure the pH and so on. How does it avoid this? Because it has, it has created a very clever trick. The bacterium has no physical wires. It has no physical addresses. It doesn't have to send things to a physical address. So you have to imagine that everything is in a solution. Right? So I'll give you now the way we would imagine a bacterial machinery would add numbers. Right? So you have a problem. I want to add a million numbers. Right? We know how to do that in a computer. You arrange them as a vector, and you just to do, and you go from one to the end, and it's done. But bacterium, the numbers aren't in a design. They reside everywhere. They're in solution inside this computer. The processes are also floating around. So we say we've got a processor, and we're going to call it an adase. All enzymes are called ases. And an adase binds two numbers, writes the sum on one of them and zero on the other, and throws them out into the solution. Okay, now, everybody knows that's a bimolecular reaction, and when you get halfway, you are slowing down because half the time you will be binding zeros. So most people would say, oh no, we have to make this this little ad is much smarter than that. But biology doesn't do it. Because to be smarter means we have to have communication between processes. And so what biology does, it invents another thing called a zero excretase. It puts this processor in the wall of the computer, and every time a zero hits it, it excretes it from the system. There is no communication between the adders. They perfectly, they perfectly, now no computer, I mean, we might try and simulate this on the processes we use, but no computer communicates through the pool, as I call it, with this. So the bacteria is then a broadcast system. Everybody's sitting in the same pool. Most of the small molecules hit the wrong protein. 
most of the time when they hit the right protein because molecular motion is very fast at this level. And most of them, when they hit the right protein, hit it in the wrong place. But there's one place on the protein known as the active site, which nature has done so. Once it's on, it doesn't go off. Right? It binds. So the off rate is, is very low. And of course, if something looks like something of these, but isn't exactly the same, it, there'd be a very high off rate there wouldn't be a chance of making an error, not much of a chance. So it does all of this, and no one's in the command for anything. All right, so, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give this bacterium a problem to solve. Problem it hasn't got a memory of, having solved it a long time ago. I'm going to grow it in heavy water. I'm told that until this, this one in 1936, there was no pure heavy water anywhere in the universe. Deuterium oxide. I put the bacterium into this. After a lot of messing around, it emerges. It grows in steady state. Okay? But it grows with three times the amount of machinery for each gene. And it grows slowly. How does it solve that problem? So what we argue, and in fact you can prove it in many ways, is that this is automatically done because of the regulating machinery. What happens is the following. Each of these subsystems is organized in a chain so that the product of one is the substrate to the other. So we can imagine now we're sending messages. We throw the message out, we broadcast it. Sooner or later, that message will reach the next enzyme. And the next enzyme will take it, maybe split it into two messages, maybe join it with another one. But whatever they do, they throw it out again. And everything will progress in this way. All right? And of course, the end product is what we need to incorporate into the, these are the bricks with which we build the bacteria. So there's a very interesting thing which has been evolved by some bacteria for the purposes of getting free lunches. See, long ago, uh, most bacteria lived where, just with the elements. And they had to get everything from hydrogen, oxygen, elementary thing, carbon dioxide. They still exist. They still exist, the parts of our planet that are still in this very primitive state. But then they discovered there were other things around, and they could actually go and live in the intestines of animals, once the animals appeared, of course. And over there, you get a lot of free food. You don't have to make everything. So they developed things which had the following. If you're getting free food, you're getting free tryptophan, and you can get it for free. So first of all, they developed machinery to pump these things into the cell. So even low concentrations they can use. They pump them in, and then they stop making their own. All right? They stop making their own, and then uh, there's also if you give them this permanently, they can actually switch off making the enzymes, making the machines that make the product, right? So they have that. So why do they do that? Because the biggest thing bacteria have to do is to make protein. The moment they can, don't have to make a bunch of enzymes, they not only save on that capacity, but they can also stop making all the other parts of the machinery that do this, and they're quite happy. So what you find is that after a while, I mean, this is the evolutionary story, they've gathered in systems that say, uh, you can get this uh, for free, so you just repress or inhibit your own reaction. Now, what, of course, we've done to the bacterium 
we've confused the enzymes. It turns out the isotopes effects are extreme for certain proton uh, re reactions, like the reduction of a double bond, fumaric to succinic acid. That is slowed 11.5%, uh, 11.5 times and synthesis of certain other compounds of the same thing are slowed by factors of 40, not just by the zero point energy, which is about 40%. So you can now ask yourself, how does this work? So what bacteria did, because they wanted to have unitary control, both of the production and of the synthesis, they picked a singular site the first reactive step. If I switch him off, the others will, will, won't, I don't have to bother switching each of them off. They will do the sequential switching. Furthermore, if I also now stop making the protein by measuring it, have I got enough of this? So that means that for different reactions, depending on whether they have one of this chemistry involved in them, uh, they are making needless protein, okay? Because if there's a step and that's the rate determining thing, they have to amplify everything else, which would be okay. And we can prove this by just giving the organism tryptophan. So you can just measure how much of the tax the deuterium is exerting by doing this. But the bacterium doesn't understand isotope effects and isn't worried about doing this all. It simply has this developed for a thing which can solve the problem. Now, <coughs> to understand all of this, you would have to ask, suppose we wanted to, to do this. It would have to change the ratios. Uh, it's an evolution experiment that I was very keen to do at one stage. But of course, I didn't have the patience that that was exerted when we were doing this with with proteum. Uh, but we may we should develop a bacterium that would be very interesting because it couldn't grow anywhere in the universe except in heavy water. I thought this would be the safest organism for genetic engineering, but it didn't work after 500 passages. But maybe we should try harder. It's a very interesting challenge because we can take it apart and look at all these costs and see what we can say. So I give you this example simply to show that if you didn't understand what you can call the lifestyle of this, that diffusion is enough to put everything there, all you have to pay attention to is the intimate design of this you don't have to organize, you don't have to do, it's self-organized. Okay, what limits this is the supply of energy. It's a global constraint, and if one process were to become greedy and try to hog everything, it would slow the growth of that bacterium because the others would have less to share, and that bacterium would be selected. So the tax for the self-organization is, in fact, capital punishment, okay? If you, the greed is published by, the greed is just eliminated. And so everybody is taught by this discipline that if one takes too much, the whole thing slows to be eliminated. Right, now. There are many parts of, so there you see is a completely different way of looking at, at a whole set of physical processes and talking about them in a different way. So now I want to take uh, uh, another complex set of phenomena because I think this is interesting and talk about it as well. Uh, there has ar arisen in uh, our science, a subject called systems biology, which uh, I, I have, uh, I have uh, christened in a, in a different way, 
I think it is high throughput biology, but I call it low input, high throughput, no output biology. <laughs> okay? Now, the, the thing of this is that it, the arguments made in this favor is very similar to this conference. It is more is better. In other words, if you can study, if you can study a thousand enzymes, why bother to do them one at a time? But actually, because we've now been given tremendous power of making atom-by-atom atom descriptions of anything, you know, because we can do structure so well and sequence so well, the point is uh, that why all these measurements should be just taken, and then the question is, how are we to put them into a structure? Against more is better, I think the least is best. Because the least argues, what do you have to know that you can compute the rest? In other words, what do you have to know such that the rest can be calculated? I mean, it's our kind of mathematics. All right, so, so I, and of course, it often comes with the anti-reductionist thing and lots of talk about emergence I think that's where complexity theory meets systems biology. Uh, I don't know what, whether that collision will have any effect on either. Actually, what systems biology is doing is asking the inverse question. And we know a lot about inverse questions. In other words, we know, we know many things that if you ask, if you have an object exhibiting some behavior, can you actually take the behavior and calculate the structure of the, of the object? In other words, imagine that there's a man playing a drum, drums in another room, and we can have all these microphones leading out, and we are just recording the sound. And from the sound, uh, we need to calculate the behavior of the drum. Uh, it turns out you can't do this. There's interference, you can't do things accurately enough, etc. The inverse question needs some a priori knowledge injected into it. And hopefully there are no nonlinear things there because we just can't cope with going backwards in this way. And there's a, lot of, there's a lot of this. The story is the alternative is get the drum, work it out, because once we've got the physics of it and the measurements and measured the elasticity and so on, we can play the drum ourselves. We can make any sound because we can compute the sound from the drum. And the, dr and the sound will have that, that thing. So, so there are many problems in science that are easily solved, and in mathematics, that are solved in the forward direction, but can't be solved in the inverse direction. Okay, so many people in systems biology believe they can do that. They can go in the opposite direction without any assumptions. Okay? Still, because I think at the end, uh, you have to look at what we, what we have. Uh, the key thing is that it is reductionist by its very nature, a biological system, because in a sense, everything is reduced to this single DNA tape, which is put into the new machines and will just create everything again. And so you cannot escape from the genes, and you cannot escape from the behavior of the molecules. They are the key to everything. So what do we put in its place? So I have thought about this a lot, and I've written about it. And I think there is a very neat analogy which we must use to capture the essence. And Amongst these things is the following. Let's suppose we face one of your cells 
And I tell you there are 20,000 genes active in it. And that means that the interactions would be a big matrix, and that's 400 million. And uh, the point is, if I had to know all of this, this would be an enormous calculation to do. And clearly, I can't do it. Neither can your liver cell do it. It's again, the bacterium. So the biological things are stupid. Uh, Jack Cowan, many years ago, he showed me in a big differential integral equation. And he said, that's the way your brain works. I said, no. It may be the way your brain works, but I know for certain my brain doesn't work this way. Okay, so uh, I think the, uh, the thing to go for now is what is a reasonable way to do this? So the first thing we recognize immediately is the matrix must be sparsely occupied. Okay, a lot of things are irrelevant. In fact, there are a lot of things whose even numerical value doesn't have to be set. And I'll come back to that as well. So that means we are thinking of strong interactions and weak interactions. Right? And so what we find is that when we look at how things work in a cell, we find that no, very few enzymes work on their own. They all work in molecular assemblies. They work in big structures, which have assembled lots of these proteins, placed them in different positions. Right, so, and the average size is 10. So this means I'm no longer, I'm accepting the average size is 10. So I'm no longer dealing with 20,000 individual protein, I'm dealing with 2,000 gadgets, devices. Okay, we're just going to call them devices. Right. Now, I can also note in a bacterial cell, it's not a homogeneous bag. There are different compartments. There's various structures in them. So give me another 10 on average compartments. So within a compartment, I am down to a few hundred of these devices. So this means that by creating this, these mod modules, okay. I am therefore only concerned with the behavior of a model because all the interactions that are very complicated, and I can mention some of them, will be played out here. But once I understand how that works, well, how it, it undergoes a cycle of change, I can convert it into a different language. I can convert it into device language. That is, I can say, I have an input here, and there's one particular thing that can actually be done in quite good detail now, and which can say that all I do is I measure the concentration the height of the peak of cyclic AMP, and I eject a number of calcium ions. That's the transfer function of this. Now, of course, what's going on in that thing is a lot of things are opening and closing, and enzymes are working, and of course, they've all got the machinery to restore themselves to the ground state. Okay? Otherwise, you wouldn't get anywhere. You would do it once, and then, as they say, the moving pen writes on. But you, you can't write on. You've got to restore the state and do it again. So, but what I'm saying is the following. We now have a very simple view of what is a very complex calculation, but we can understand how that is done, and therefore we can submerge that detail to the level of these molecular vices. And notice, they communicate with each other. They have an input, and they have an output. 
And this output actually in the case I'm talking about is actually then will finally result, the output of calcium will finally result in a muscular contraction because that goes to other machines and so on. Right? Now these machines don't know each other. Nothing is directed. That is, it's, they find each other by the diffusion of this, but it's in a compartment which is effectively okay, and sometimes the compartments are very big, and then they need to enhance diffusion in a special way. And one of the fascinating things is that everything that works in the cell membrane is plugged into the cell membrane with a little tag, which is essential to its function. And that, of course, cuts down the diffusion by a, a, degree, of a degree of variation, because it's now only two-dimensional diffusion. And so everything can move. And things that work on DNA work by one-dimensional diffusion. They scramble along the surface of the DNA. So everything can then be reduced to the same old machinery. And of course, sometimes it can't. And we actually have to put it onto other machines, which are then told to walk down a set of <coughs> tubules till they get to their destination. Right? And we have specialized proteins that can do this this work of carrying things. Right, so there is, in a way, this network isn't the sort of thing that looks like a railway, that looks like a, uh, the Tokyo Metro, which many people in systems biology join, you know, with arrows and so on, till the actual drawing is more complicated than the thing itself. But what is important is to grasp these levels. And so what we've done is we've said the cell can be reduced okay, to mo molecules through a set of compartments and devices. It's an intermediate thing. Right? And of course, when we look at the organism, we can do exactly the same. We can have the same structure because the organism is looking at cells, so to speak, but has them grouped many times in special uh, organs or whatever you want to call it. Uh, again, there's this intermediate level in which we agglomerate certain functions together. Well, I think that that is, that is the way of explaining everything the functioning of this incredible network, uh, I don't think it poses any problems because nature actually, if you go into these molecular devices, the strong interactions are the ones that have condensed the modules. The modules communicate by messages. So it isn't an instructional system. There isn't a boss saying, do this. It's not like a computer program which is written in the imperative. And I think there are, many, there are many things which are own limitations of the way we actually think and the way we actually speak but do not allow us to grasp a parallel things that work in parallel. Because, you know, we can only go down about three levels with while. So sooner or later, we have to climb back again. And so subsidiary clauses, they don't give us the essence of the parallelism that we can grasp in this way. So I think biology has shown us how we can actually cope with self-organization and how we can actually structure it. But what I want to say is that if you want to uh, there be many ways to formulate languages for biology, but effectively it should just be the language of biology. That is, there is nothing else.
descriptive of the thing than what it is, if I can put it. And so this idea of trying to organize biology by ontology, that is, you know, exactly where the names come from, is nonsense. I mean, I wrote an article called Ontology Recapitulates Philology, you see, because it's nothing. You just say, that's that it ends up. That's what it does. It's the objects themselves and not by the name. And you know, there is a big difference in language uh, between, between, these, uh, between these things, you see. I once got lost at a meeting in, in, in uh, Laguna Beach. I was at a meeting. I went to the wrong room for the breakfast meeting. And there were a whole lot of extremely large guys there, and they all had badges, and one read, Hi, I'm Chuck, you know, or I'm Bill, you know, huge things. And I thought, you know, we don't do that because you don't do this because you say, you do always give your surname. You say, My name, oh, I am, I, sorry. My name is John Smith. It's by your name, not by who you are. See? Now, who I am is my business. That's what I would like to do. Sidney Brenner and who I am is my business. I am not Chuck or Bill or any one of that. However, I also mistook the name of the meeting. I thought it said veterans, but it said veter veterinarians. <laughs> So I, so they were people dealing with horses, I think. Anyway, that's another story. But I think that this is the object. And finally, I've, I've asked myself, because if we had other objects that we wish to do, and we wish to talk about uh, this, how would we actually do this? So what I've given you is an outline of a system called cell map. It's just a way of embodying all the data. I cannot get anybody to help me to do to implement this because uh, for various reasons, but it's, it's in my head. But I'm going to give you a thing for an analogous thing. So suppose we want to understand how a city works. Okay. What do we do? Well, if you look at the white pages of the telephone directory, that's the genome. It's got a location for everybody. It's the genome sequence. And you hope that everybody's there. It lists everybody. It doesn't give you any other information. That's the way we should think about the genes. The genes have a location, this coordinate on the DNA. Okay. Now, of course, the next thing you do is you can you look at the yellow pages. Huh, and you discover on this block the nine plumbers. So that means there must be pipes in the city because plumbers plumb pipes. But the whole essence, and so it's called the annotated genome. You add in descriptions onto the genes. This gene does that. But let me tell you how a city works. Right. The thing's called homes, like apartments, houses, and every morning they disaggregate the components, and the components then travel to other aggregates, other assemblages, where they interact in a completely different way, and they go to schools, hospitals, banks, etc., etc. We don't, have to, we don't have to worry about collisions between your banker and yourself. You only have to worry if he summons you to the bank, okay? <coughs> because random collisions don't mean anything. So we have to look at these institutions. And without that, you don't understand the city. You don't even begin to understand. And with that, I think, says this modular construction is the most important thing. And everybody who's written sophisticated computer programs 
knows that if you keep things connected, you can't debug them. Okay, because a fault here will just ramify throughout the system. In fact, I have seen that there are many things in computer programs because people don't want to take them out, even though they don't know if they're being used at all. But they're scared that there might be some unlikely thing. This is for big operating system software that was written uh, by lots of different people. So, I think that that's the key. Now, whether you call this an attack on complexity, I think that complexity should be looked at like income tax, actually. I mean, is there a way of just avoiding it? You know, let's not worry about how many partial differential equations we have to solve. Let's see if there are ways of doing it. Now, of course, it defeats many of the objects of mathematics and some of the objects of physics. But I'll tell you what I think is the take-home message. Mathematics is the art of the perfect. Physics is the art of the optimal, but biology is only the art of the satisfactory. Thank you. I think I'm preaching to the preachers here, <laughs> not even to the converts. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, my my question is actually quite quite simple. Uh, would you would you agree if uh, we characterize sort of all of life in a way as as a sort of a diffuse mixture of autonomous agents that that have basically short local feedback loops, which are optimized? Yeah but everything else is simply a diffuse exchange. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what biology teaches us, that we don't have to actually organize it, you know, in this way. So this is, but I mean, that is for, that is for, I think, uh, to be, you know, because there are lots of other things that go on on the social level, and even in organizational I mean, I, someone asked me, what's the best way of organizing science? You see? And I said, loose gangs and a few commandos. You know, some just hop out. Um, and I think that's the <coughs> best way. It's the best way to not to organize. It. That's uh, what I'm But maybe, maybe an add-on to this is there are people whose job it is to organize. So in that case, once you have a goal-oriented mission, what do you do? I know. Well, I think that you have to you have to find out ways of treating them as income tax. <laughs> I mean, we've got to actually uh, work out ways of dealing with this. I mean, I now know that many things become rooted. All right, and there are people doing it. The reason you have, as I pointed out, administration is a way of trying to make sparse matrices. The same is true of group meetings. Because what everybody would like to do is to just have person-to-person -person interaction. Well, then the number of interactions goes with the square of the number. Okay? And what's left over for output is very small. It's like that like that. So to minimize this is you create subgroups and groups like this so that you can treat them as devices. All right? But I think that what has happened is that what I think has happened and which I object to tremendously is I was once told by an administrator that administration you need no domain knowledge. That is, he felt that administering an F-14 fighter squadron was the same as administering a girls' high school. 
See, he just felt it's just organization. Now that I think is wrong. I think not to know the domain of the thing is to really ask for trouble. But what has grown up is the pure science of management, you see, the pure, I, was, I don't know whether to call it an art or a science, a craft, no, the cult, the pure cult of management. Well, uh, to, to your job is to manage. To redeem myself, I'm a biologist, but I teach at a business school. Sorry, and I can't hear you. I'm a biologist, but I teach at a business school. But I do try to inculcate them self-organization. Yeah. Well, I think this is the, this is the best way. But, I mean, uh, see, science has now grown tremendously. If you think of just in what has happened in the last 10, 20 years with this organization, it has become corporate, a corporate structure. And, of course, it has depended on certain things which I think are adverse, which is that it's built, at least in American science, the scientists have become money raisers and managers, and it's built on slavery, which are graduate students, and indentured laborers, postdocs. <laughs> <laughs> Right, and that's the way it's built, you see. So no one, so this business of, and you're not supposed to innovate as well, because, you know, that could lead to long delays, and you've got all these performance indicate impact factors. So I think it's, it's very different from, uh, you know, the way I grew up in, in science, where you did a lot of things yourself, but it was, and everybody could do this kind of self-expression. And, uh, but I think now it is organized in many ways, have become big organization, especially in biology. And I can only say that uh, there must be some way of, uh, of doing things, you know, seeding things differently because uh, once these structures emerge, they, they really take it out of the system. And I think now most people aren't, aren't interested in science and the other things they want to do. They aren't interested in doing this. And people say, oh, it's a lack of curiosity. But you see, I don't believe that curiosity is the thing. And in fact, I think it's a dangerous word to use because every politician will put the word idle in front of it. Idle curiosity, you see? So I'll tell you a true story. When uh, one of Mrs. Thatcher's junior ministers came around to the lab in Cambridge, and he said to me, uh, he says, what are you people, you know, you're not helping the economy, you're not doing anything, you're just in this ivory castle. I said, I said, tell me, I said, have you ever solved a problem that no one else has solved? He said, what do you mean? I said, well, there's been a problem, you know, it's been hanging around, there's no solution, and you find a solution. And he said, he says, come to think of it, no. I said, that's what we do here. <laughs> yeah? So science is problem solving. And it's not divided into applied science, pure science, basic, or anything. And I believe we should be judged on the quality of the problems we choose and the quality of the solutions we find. And that's all what science means. So I don't think that being curious may drive you to be curious. Uh, you may also like it for its aesthetic value. But that doesn't come into it. The object is pose the problem, and find a way of solving it. So that's what I think we've lost now. Because all we do is, you know, there's a regular thing, you go through the motions, you get your PhD thesis, you do the same thing, you take a bit of your supervisor's project, then you plonk another little place in, if you're lucky enough to get a job, you raise money, and you grab a little claim of your own. You don't, you don't get new things out of that. And one of the fascinating things in my subject, and I think it's probably true for all science, 
Big changes are made by one or a very small group of people. Often immigrants, not of countries, but immigrants from other sciences. That is, they fed up with fundamental particle theory, want to do something else. They come into a different science and they change it. And that's what you've got to, and at the moment, that is now strongly discouraged. It's discouraged because you won't get funding for it. Uh, I mean, I once applied for a grant in America, and I scored way below the average for the score. Let me tell you, when, when poor starts at 90 percent percentile, goes down, you know, I was way down, never fun. The reason they didn't give it to me is I didn't have any experience in this. They said, I've never worked with cancer cells before, and therefore I was unlikely to, to do this. They don't care what you've done. You haven't to solve, you know, other problems of the fooling around with cancer cells. That's easy. Uh, but they didn't give me the card. They wanted to hook me up with someone who I regarded as pretty low level, you know, to do to work with him. I said, <coughs> it. So we did it. We did it. I said, but well, we did it. We let a first year graduate do the experiment, and he did it, and it worked. So, what did they say? It's just too risky. It's unlikely to work. That's what they've said about everything. So I think this whole of this peer review is a lot of nonsense. It's a lot of nonsense, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. To be reviewed by your peers is to be reviewed by your equals. And peer review started from a famous thing in, in Britain where the peers of the realm refused to be reviewed by their inferiors, <laughs> the ordinary people in Parliament, but needed to be reviewed by their equals. So if we take peer review serious, then the people on the committee should be average people. Right? So I'm told uh, that a lot of the people who apply for funding fail. They don't get it. They only give it six percent or eight percent. So this means that ninety-four percent of the people who serve on the review committee to be the equals of the people they are judging should have failed. Most of them should never have got to them. <laughs> <laughs> only then can they judge them. So of course it, it makes nonsense. See, so I I think that that a lot of the things which have become Really big things, you know, peer review. Uh, anyway, I shouldn't go on. <laughs> I always said, you know, I always define peer review as follows. You take the guy out to the end of the Atlantic City pier, you put his feet in concrete blocks, and you push him off and you review whether he sinks or floats. <laughs> Okay, sorry to indulge. <laughs> so it's virtually impossible to ask uh, a question after such a wonderful talk. Um, I'm, I'm sincerely impressed, but nevertheless, I, I'm going to try to ask a question. Um, the um, so your your let's say your mechanistic model that you that you laid out to us, which is um, well clean and clear. Um, what, what do you think about, you know, uh, if you think in terms of translational science, would it be possible to help the, let's say, the social economical problems by translating this very successful mechanistic model that nature has developed over the last million years, billion years? Um, now, that is a successful model, as you showed us, and it has very particular characteristics um, which seem to survive and which seem to be efficient in all, all respects, would it be possible to translate, let's say, that, that kind of thinking, that kind of terminology, that kind of con concepts to our social and economical environment? Well, I think that that's very difficult. For 
I think economics has been has been really bounded by its assumptions. I mean, you know, in other words, uh, they were too much imbued with what I call the perfect hysterical economy. Mm -hmm. You know, and then everything reacts according to the principles of thermodynamics or whatever was the analogy used. And if you plug in this thing, so it is, of course, because you see, what you have that's different from biology is you have people, the objects, the elements in this, have a theory about what they're living in themselves. And some of them can actually direct their actions towards their own views. I mean, you see, if my molecules had their own views, the gene said, I'm fed up. <laughs> that would be another gene. That would be, we'd be, there'd be chaos. Because you only have, you see, you only have this if the phenotype, that is, the, the behavior, is predictable from the sequence. If it were unpredictable, if every time I ran the same sequence, and I just changed the initial condition, so instead of you turning out to be you, you turn out to be a zebra or something. <laughs> we, 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 it wouldn't work. So I think that we must look for these things, and we must look to see how this can be modulated. Now, I happen to believe, you see, that if we look at animals in biology, not humans now, and we look to see how they have created social structures of some sort, uh, whether they herds of animals running across the plate or tribes of lions hunting or whatever they do, uh, many of those things have been selected by natural selection. In other words, the habia is instinctive, so they speak. And of course, you all know the famous work, which Fabre's work, which destroyed the idea that uh, insects had intelligence. Because insects are plainly, they simply have roots that they go through, which he tested by experiment. Now, very really interesting things to read there. He excluded that view. But you see, we are different as human beings. So I think we definitely need something that's ch that changed. So maybe 250 years ago, million years ago, it was okay, you know. Uh, we could rely on our instincts that said, eat as much as you can when you get it. And if you have excess, think, convert it into fat and store it. Because as sure as hell, the famine is going to come next. But, you know, Southern California is no famine. So we just keep on with this. So we have our biological thing is maladapted to the environment which is our creation. So you have you have three things that have happened in society. One is uh, we have people saying, oh well, we'll have to change the genetics. We'll have to just genetically engineer, re-engineer people. That's a nonsense. It'll never happen. The next thing is, uh, we'll patch it. When it goes wrong, we'll give it some pills. It's called the pharmaceutical industry, and so on. And the other thing is that we need to change the matching condition. And that'll take two things. One, to modulate the environment. And the other thing is education. Because you see, most of our animal cells is lodged in an organ called the hypothalamus. I call it the glad organ because it's, it's greed, lust, avarice, and desire all <laughs> programmed there. Okay. And the prefrontal cortex sends down inhibition. So Freud was right. The id is in the hypothalamus. The superego is in the prefrontal cortex. And you know, we have a technology is available to change the prefrontal cortex. It's called education. We talk to <laughs> so what I think we really need to do is to have a much, because this 
I think is the only way we can work at the root elements of our society. And then hopefully, you know, we can change it. It will change. Uh, but, as you know, this is... Uh, I just want to tell you a, a nice little story to illustrate the power of natural selection. Uh, there is a parasite uh, of uh, rodents, uh, which infects them. That's a toxoplasma. It grows in them. But to complete its life cycle, it completes its life cycle in the intestine of cats. Okay, now, rodents have an instant and genetically programmed fear of cats. It's not that they recognize cats, but they can smell them. <coughs> so you can do experiments on this well know that there's programmed, there's a smell of cat, which will just drive rodents mad. Okay, now what you can do with this is you can train this rodent. So what happens is, the rodent actually inhabits the hypothalamus and it turns the cat's odor into a sexual attractant for the rodent. So it is driving the rodent into the mouths of the cats so it can complete its life cycle. You see, now all of that's happened not because they planned it in any way, but effectively that's just the way it happened. It interferes with certain, we think, branches of the nerves there. And so they become sexually attracted by the cat's odor rather than fleeing away from it. That is so they can get eaten and the toxoplasma can continue its, its, its survival. But the important thing is this. We know that all of that is programmed program in one little part of the hypothalamus. Because when we move this out, and even though we've now conditioned that rat to be fear of a cat when it sees it, because we've associated the smell or the sight, it will just walk out in front of the cat, pay no attention to it. Of course, it's interesting to look at this, because now the cat is very possible. <laughs> so, but I think that we've got to learn more about this interaction between our cortex and, you know, the beast within us. That's the, that's the important thing. Can, can I just ask you to expand on what you see is wrong with, with the current direction of systems level approaches to... I mean, is it that the... Do you think the wrong data has been collected or what... Most I, of the data yeah. is useless. We throw them away because it's been collected. <coughs> it's not accurate enough. Most of the data is useless. It's, in, it's what I, I have a criteria for data called the CAP criteria, C-A-P. It stands for complete, accurate, and permanent. You don't have to do it again. That's a real database. We can look at these tables of complete. So it's inaccurate, it's incomplete, and it's just jolly well temporary. It will have to be done again. And so I think it's also compounded by a, a technical that because if you imagine that you're setting the level of a protein, or whatever you measure, the amount, and you set that, and it has been set, there is a cost of doing it. It's an evolutionary cost. Somewhere there will be some DNA sequence that will be measuring this and determining it. And in order to have it, you've got to have that sequence. So to evolve these controls has an evolutionary cost. Okay. So if it has no effect, that is, the three values are good, 
bad and indifferent. That is, plus, minus, don't care, can be ten times higher. There are many things that I can show you that have just been left performing no useful function, but just because it doesn't matter uh, whether they, they express in this or not, uh, you've still got the main effect, and you don't care about this extra cost because it's played no role. So we don't know when we measure things which are important and which are just simply going in for the ride. Okay, and that's one of the difficulties. We also don't know, we don't know the connections between all of these. We don't have the feedback loops uh, specified. And with this, we also don't know uh, most of the things that count are oscillators. Okay, that is, they go up, and then they must come down again, they must be restored to the ground level, they have to work again. So there's a lot of machinery that does None of these measurements are available at all, okay, because they are the wrong ones are being measured. So the best way to say is if you want to know an answer, what data will you need? <coughs> not the data that's been collected. Because if that result is not there in the data collected, you might as well just throw the lot to that. You're not going to learn anything from it. So I think this is what's needed, is to actually say, look, I need to know the exact number of molecules and their location, because otherwise it's, it's not useful. So I think a lot of that will have to just be done over again. Time for a couple more questions. It's a very fascinating presentation. Um, what I would like to ask is you mentioned that nowadays people, um, the metabolism in the body is still adjusting uh, like when the famine or the long time ago, our ancestors, we are still storing fat. And all the pharmaceuticals, all the educations were trying to overcome that. Do you think within, I don't know, 10, 20, perhaps 50 or 100 generations from now, the genetic will be changing again, adapting to the new uh, exposure uh, nowadays that we are uh, facing? Well, I'll tell you what will happen. If there is new biological, new biological evolution, it will be for small people, okay? Because they don't need so much room to live in, they don't consume as much. So as it's happened in evolution, elephants have been selected, pygmy elements, Okay. So it'll be for small people. So half of American managers <laughs> are doomed. You see, they'll be they doomed to extinction. <laughs> because they're too big and too fat, and they just arc if there is biological evolution. So it's only people like me that <laughs> <laughs> All the small people of all these giants you know, who weigh, I mean, I mean, I want to meet a guy who's 30, and I reckon he hadn't seen his toes, hadn't seen his toes for the last 10 years. <laughs> uh, they had to give him a special safety belt in the aeroplane. He had to buy two seats, too. Anyway, that's, uh, but I think if there is biological evolution, if there is, there's no, not really much sign of so, uh, yeah. Well, I don't think we'll exclude that. The best way is, uh, you know, I mean, there are lots of ideas on how to do this. The best way I know is just to make obesity a crime. Yeah, just, just make it a criminal offence. You get arrested and you send to my jail. In my jail, you put on a bicycle. And the bicycle pumps water from a low level up through all the levels, stores it on top, and of course we generate electricity from it. <laughs> so I'm converting biomass. Because the amount of biomass that's walking around 
The United States is the fattest country in the world. And Australia is number two. So that's the thing. Yes, because it, it's now called the survival of the fattest. <laughs> <laughs> Unnatural selection. <laughs> so the first thing, I think Japan does have now a law uh, regarding waste size, and there's like fines to pay for, uh, I'm not sure if that actually passed, maybe someone really, there, this was on the news uh, in America that they were doing this, and how we needed that, right? Uh, Has what? Uh, a law regarding waste size, and there's like regulations. Oh, yes, yes. yes, right. So it's it's coming yes. to that. Uh, some countries can can pull that off. Uh, not so easy in America, right? Well, um, the other thing you see is to take them all to this to these big places where you see signs called waste management. <laughs> so <they're laughs> And uh, my other comment is, uh, so we talk about uh, this response to famine and storing the fat and this being maladaptive, but this could be a temporarily maladaptive thing. Uh, as we've mentioned, resources are thinning and thinning and thinning, and you know maybe we aren't too far away from more famines, and that uh, having this biological response might be a really good thing to have 100 years from now. Well, I think that that is, uh, I mean, one of the things is that it is that societies seem to have an automatic limit to population growth. And that's interesting, because now most societies, America's not replacing itself, it's only keeping its population constant by immigration. Britain is declining, and I think, uh, I'm not sure what's going on in Singapore, but I think it's, it's that level. And that's because, you know, there are alternatives. So, so nobody has to have lots of children so that some will survive to look after you in your old age. It's pensions having that. You see, there's substitutes. And of course, there's a lot of other things you want to do in society and do this. So I think those are things that seem to be self-regulating in that sense. But nonetheless, there still is, as societies become more developed, uh, you know, we have a lot of it. The trouble with the world is there's a lot of overdeveloped people living in underdeveloped countries, and a lot of underdeveloped people living in overdeveloped countries. Okay, so this is a mismatch as well. And I think that uh, as long as we, we can't do this. So I think the only hope that we can do is actually proper education. I think people should take more responsibility for their health. You see, my view is this. They have leased the human genome. That means they've got to look after it. If they don't look after it, I'm going to come and take it away from them. I can't do that. I have to change them so that they look after this, this gene. I mean, that's the thing. And now, how you do this, I think this is a, this is a massive problem. It won't be solved easily, uh, because now the common man in the street believes, and woman believes, I can do what I like, I, I can eat, I can watch as much TV, I can drink what I like, and medicine will save me with the pill. That's the belief, you see. The belief is, and of course, the pharmaceutical industry has propagated this, uh, this great thing. They now are running to the end of what they can save you with. Because now the diseases that are coming are, you know, the old machines are just being run in. And you can't trade them in for a new one anymore. You know? So this is why. I think we now see the big incidents of the diseases that accompany our age. It isn't that, you see, we, we call Alzheimer a disease. It's not, it's the ultimate fate. Okay, it's just what happens. But some people are lucky that it happens late, and some people it happens early, and a lot of people die before they can get it of other diseases. So as more as we cure infectious disease, 
as we dealt with malnutrition, which were the big killers. Uh, I mean, the, the infant mortality rates are really something to look at. Uh, infant mortality is death in the first year. The country that is the highest in numbers is Angola, 16%. 16.4%. The next one is uh, Afghanistan, is the next one, about 16%. America, shamefully, is 3.9%. So one in 25 kids die. Now, if you go back in history and, and look at infant mortality, in Britain, you know, in the early in the 17th century, the early periods there, it's, it's reputed to be as very normally was 30%, and it's generally as high as 50%. So it is that that then, you know, engender plus <coughs> infectious disease taking everybody like <coughs> this. So I think it's a price we pay. Uh, it's uh, you know, logically, the only way we would deal with Alzheimer's is to find other diseases. So, <laughs> 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 I'm joking, of course. So, I once had a theory of how we should change, uh, like economics, we can revolutionize, so to speak between demand and supply. So there was the supply economy. So the way you deal with health care in the supply is you decide there will be 100,000 cases of this disease <laughs> this year. Okay? The committee decides, administrators. And then they are filled up, first come, first serve. When it runs out, people have to die of other causes. <laughs> the job of medical research is to find other diseases. Because next year you're going to improve it. You're going to cut it down to 90,000 cases. So you show this. Uh, the other thing was that uh, hospitals are not the places to die. So a doctor, if he sends you to hospital, should sign a contract to say you are likely to be cured. Because if you're not, you should be sent home. Dying should be done at home, not in a hospital. These are, you know, you recognize them, they parodies or many other things. So that we improve the, the thing, but we don't get to the end of course. One last one. I, I just try to understand your, your title. You, you should talk about the bacteria. It's maybe no many other administration job. But there are other animals like bees, ants, monkey. They have some other administration role. Human society have lots of other administration role. I think whatever the system it is, either with or without the administration job, there are some benefits, some disadvantages. So what's the major reason which you think is not necessary to have a administration job. I just try to understand why you would think it may not be necessary. I don't understand why you think the administration is not needed. Well, you see, humans changed everything. Okay? Because they started a new form of evolution. The moment they decided, they didn't decide this in this way, but this is just the story, <coughs> that to survive the cold, you need a body covered with hair. So when it got very cold, uh, the people who went around without any hair should have died, and only their hairy friends should have survived. But they discovered another thing. You go out and you kill an animal, like a bear, and you put on its skin. So in one job like that, you actually think that it might have taken millions of years of evolution, of 
course, we were hair and wands, of course, so you'd have to get a throwback suit. But that is the big step, because then you just became independent of your genes. You could do other things. You weren't restricted to what you could generate yourself. So I think the cultural evolution has been that big step. And that's, of course, the product of the brain, which can calculate the future. Because this is the interesting thing. See, I don't think other animals can speculate or even calculate the future. But this association can be made. And I think that's the big change. Therefore, this is the case. So, you have to deal with it at that level. And the only thing is actually get these brains to do the right sort of things. That's the only way society will, will, can become participatory in that sense. But, OK, I don't know. But I, I think that there's a lesson for us. Um, so I think everybody should, in their own way, should see what they are doing wrong, even in their little local thing. And I think quite a lot of low-level organization could be improved by, uh, by just adopting different, different ways of doing it. Okay. Thank you.